Publius Virgilius Maron, often nicknamed Virgil, was an ancient Roman poet. His poems have always been read and considered most praiseworthy. Linking the founding of Roman culture to the Trojan War, describing one of the most tragic romances ever written, explaining the fundamental source of Roman conflict with Carthage. In this video, you may learn details about one of the books in Virgil's eternal renowned epic, the Aeneid. Book 3, The Trojan Odyssey. In the previous book, Troy was captured. In the process, Aeneas not only lost his wife, but also found signs that his son might have a divine purpose. Now he is the leader of a group of refugees. He tells the group to quickly build some ships, and they all set sail in search of a new home. The first land they encounter is in Thracia. Initially, they are satisfied with this location. Aeneas traces where their future walls and streets will be. While they build a small altar and aim to adorn it with vegetation, the hero describes that. I pulled a plant with horror I relate. A prodigy so strange and full of fate. I tore the fibrous roots and from the wound. Dark red blood squirted out of the ground. He pulled some more and more until finally a voice spoke. Why do you run apart my buried body? Oh spare the corpse of thy unhappy friend. The blood that pours from this living tree. Once pumped through Trojan veins. Flee at once this unhospitable shore. My fate is a warning, for I am Polydor. The poet explains that Polydor was the youngest child of Priam. During the war, the king of Troy had hired a man in Thracia to protect this child in case the city was taken. This same man treacherously decided to kill the young boy and stole the money. Alas, now the boy's spirit is tied or fused with the plants and trees. The whole party of survivors is appalled by the malady of the land. A land wherein the vegetation bleeds the blood of the Trojan prince. As a result, they perform an appropriate funeral for the child and vote to leave and attempt finding another location to make their new home. Subsequently, they arrive at the island of Delos. Later, in real history, this will be an Athenian possession. For a time, the island served as the center or capital of the defensive alliance against Persia. Either way, the poet has it that the island was already a sacred site. In this little island, the survivors find a priest. Aeneas asks for counsel or prophecy and the oracle reveals. Undaunted youths, go your mother earth. The land where your ancestors were birthed. Be born again on the soil that was your cradle. Only there the fates would allow you to settle. Through the wide world the Aeneas house shall reign. And children's children shall the crown sustain. Alas, as most prophecies, the meaning or message is up for debate. The hero's father, Anchises, argues that the oracle must mean the island of Crete. The father explains that Crete was the Trojan original home, and it, the island, is currently free of any tyrants. Therefore, they all sail for Crete, and when they arrive, they begin settling a new city. They progress until... The grass was parched, and the corn was blighted. Invisible vapors choked the wholesome air. Bodies fell unconscious, cursed by the plague. Alas, the pandemic convinces them that they must continue their journey. Aeneas therefore returns to Delos and describes how Apollo, the god, spoke directly to him. The deity said, A land there is, Hesperia called of old. The soil is fruitful, and the natives bold. The Enotrians held it once, by later fame. Now called Italia, from the leader's name. It turns out that Italia, not Crete, allegedly, is the original home of the Trojans. When he is told, Aeneas' father admits his error as he says. Such things, and more, Cassandra foretold. I am reliving in my mind how she spoke. That Troy reborn in Italy would prosper. In Latin lands, but who then considered? Oh, whoever listened to her maddening lessons? The party sails again and, conflicted by a storm, they arrive on a Greek island. Here and there tormented by a group of harpies. The poet describes the flying monsters and how these steal their food. 
It reminds me of what happens to Phineas and Jason and the Argonauts. Of course, on this channel you may also learn about Apollonius of Rhodes' epic poem. In this story, the Trojans try to fight the winged creatures to no avail until the Harpy's leader, a certain Selino, says, What? Not contented with our oxen slain? Dare you with heaven and impious war maintain? And drive the Harpies from their native reign? Surprisingly, it is the flying beasts that are offended. They see the humans as invaders trespassing on their territory. Therefore, the Harpy's leader warns that she will take eternal vengeance on the Trojan refugees. Although worried by the curse, the party once again sets sail. They pass by several Greek cities until they make harbor at a certain city named Chaunia. Herein, of all people, they find Andromache. This was the captive wife of Hector. It turns out that she has now gained her freedom. She explains to the refugees that at first, she was the forced concubine of Neoptolemus, Achilles' son. However, when he chose to marry a daughter of Helen, she herself married a fellow Trojan slave, a certain Helenus. And so, they lived in relative tranquility until Orestes killed Achilles' child. It will be remembered from Euripides the Trajan women that Orestes felt that Neoptolemus had stolen his wife. Either way, somehow, it is not clear to me, this death resulted in the slaves gaining their freedom and also, somehow, incredibly, they now rule over the city of Chaunia. I guess, perhaps, the death of the king left a power vacuum wherein Andromache was able to gain a piece of freedom for herself. Like I said, the poet is not very clear on the details, it is as if he assumes that everyone knows about how, let me call it, social mobility, tends to happen. Indeed, as Adam Smith explains, in darker times inheritance is stressed, but in reality, the children of the wealthy have a tougher time remaining wealthy. The refugees stay in the city for a couple of days. Aeneas asks the local seer to tell them about their upcoming voyage to Italy. The priest says that it is against divinity's will for him to reveal all, but he will mention the most important pieces of information. He tells the party to avoid, at all costs, disembarking in southern Italy. Likewise, they must not attempt crossing the space between the peninsula and the island of Sicily. They must sail around Sicily to get to central Italy. The reasons for this are, first, that southern Italy is filled with Greek cities that will be foes. Second, that a ship-destroying creature, a sea monster, lies in waiting at the passage between Italy and the island. This seer also mentions that Aeneas must gather the civil books. These are the books which will foretell the future of Rome. These books were a real historical tool of the Roman Senate. They were surely an invention as they were used only when panic seized the city and religion was needed to justify or validate an unpopular or seemingly dangerous course of action. According to Dionysus of Halicarnassus, the civil books were gained during the tyrannical reign of Tarquinius. Back to the poem, in a moving scene, as the refugees depart, Andromache, the former wife of Hector, bestows many gifts upon the party. She says to Aeneas' son, Thou callest my lost Astyanax to mind. In thee his features and his form I find. This whets the eyes of anyone who remembers Euripides' play. As they sail, there is a description of the night sky and the various constellations. As the sun rises, the poet sings. It was when the rising morn with rosy light adorns the skies and puts the stars to flight. When we from far like bluish mists descry the hills and then the plains of Italy. They make a stop on a Sicilian shore where they make various offerings to the gods. It is said that certain signs indicate the land is caught in an arduous war. I should note that the religious rituals were as the priest in Andromache's city ordered. These are, I am guessing, the same rituals that the Romans ever continued until Christianity's invasion. Sailing once more, the Trojans arrive at the channel between Italy and Sicily. Herein they encounter the ship-destroying monster, Charybdis, and, avoiding it, continue to make their way round the island. Eventually, they catch sight of a lone figure on a desolate shore. It is a poor castaway that beckons their aid. When they approach, it is clear that this is a Greek, one of those that attacked Troy, but he explains. I offer but the air that surrounds us. 
Nonetheless, O Trojans, take me hence. It is true, I am Greek, and I freely admit. With my peers your lost home I besieged. For such demerits if my death be due. No more for this abandoned life I sue. Only this favor my tears wish to obtain. Kill me quickly, do not leave me maimed. Moved by pity of the lone man, Aeneas asks him to explain how he ended up in such a condition. He says that his name is Achaemenides and that he was a soldier of Odysseus. He was with the great hero when they accidentally encountered Neptune's son, the Cyclops. This allows the poet to describe the famed scene of how Ulysses and his men crippled the monster by blinding his single eye. No sooner had the castaway told his story than the very Cyclops appeared in the distance. Yikes! The man had been accidentally abandoned when the party of Greeks fled, and he had since then been living in hiding from the monstrous, now blind, one-eyed giant. The Trojans accept him as they all flee likewise. He becomes the fleet's guide as he shows them the path around Sicily. They pass by many shores and towns. At one moment, in an unexplained manner, through old age, Aeneas' father breathes his last breath. This is the end of the story that the hero is relating. The scene returns to Dido's palace. Aeneas expresses how grateful he is for the Carthaginians' welcome. Although here ends this book, know that in the next book we'll focus on the eternal renowned tragic and fatal love. Don't miss it. Now, to pique your curiosity, to motivate you to watch the last video of the series, I gift you a teaser sample of the many aphorisms I crafted as I read this author. Since future happiness is never safe, ever make sure you enjoy the present. If you enjoy or gain from my aphorisms, know that I have thousands. I will be writing books with short thematic essays composed out of aphorisms. These essays are profound and intriguing yet easy to read. For very cheap copies, look up Protagoras Pause in the Amazon website. I repeat, Protagoras Pause, that's my name.